This episode is brought to you in part by the American Homebrewers Association, a hub for homebrewers since 1978. Visit homebrewersassociation.org for award-winning recipes, brewing tips, and community. Homebrewersassociation.org. Welcome to Basic Brewing Radio for Thursday, January 9th, 2020. I'm James Spencer. Here at Basic Brewing Radio, we're all about home brewing. This week, Jim Lochran, author of A Beer Drinker's Guide to Knowing and Enjoying Fine Wine, gives us some tips from the grape side. As beer lovers, how do we expand our world toward finding and enjoying tasty wines? If you go to basicbrewing.com, you can find archives of our audio and video shows. If you go to basicbrewingshop.com, you can find our DVDs, our brewer's logbooks, and other basic brewing gear. You can follow me on Instagram and Twitter, at Basic Brewing, and find our show page on Facebook as well. We have a cool Basic Brewing app on iTunes and Amazon.com, and we're found all over the place where fine podcasts are served up. If you want to support us financially, check out Patreon.com slash Basic Brewing, and thanks to everybody who's helping out in that way. If you go to Patreon.com slash Basic Brewing, you can see long lists of stuff that you can access if you sign up as a supporter. Steve and I are planning to get together to record video and audio episodes uh, soon. Uh, right after I got over my recent uh, respiratory affliction, Steve got something similar. So uh, we're, we're under the weather, it, it, it concur- not concurrently, but, uh, uh, you know, right after another. Uh, <laughs> I'm hoping we'll be all better by early next week to uh, record new material. Uh, one of the topics that we'll be uh, talking about is a uh, hop stand length experiment. Um, I took the the basic hop sampler recipe, and I varied the length of time that the hops stayed in the hot wort before chilling. I usually just do 30 minutes, but I did just flame out and then chill right away, 10 minutes and then 30 minutes. So uh, we've got those. uh, It's all the same hop. It's all cascade. It's just the length of time uh, that we kept or I kept those in there in the hot wort at the uh, at the end is different. So that'll be a fun one to test. Uh, Let's hear a word from our friends and sponsors at Tavor. Uh, Tavor is a way to select delicious craft beers that you may not be able to find in your area and have them delivered to you. It's not a beer of the month club where somebody else, some random person, randomly chooses things for you. You only pay for the beer that you choose over the course of the month. Signing up for Tavor is free. Just create an account at Tavor.com. That's T-A-V as in Victor, O-U-R.com. And download their iPhone or Android app, and you'll receive notifications for two new beers each day that are available for purchase with in-depth tasting notes from Philip at Tavor. Uh, Megan at Tavor is very excited about this month's selections. Uh, She says that Tavor will be featuring Jay Wakefield, Tired Hands, Hardywood Park, Zillicoa, Masthead, Cellar Maker, Divine Barrel, Kent Falls, Moonraker, Kelly Green, and King's Brewing. So, uh, if you're not interested in those beers, uh, <laughs> but if, if you see uh, beers that you're not interested in on the app, no worry. Just skip the ones that you don't want. However, when you see something that you do want, and you will, don't wait. Just click on it and add it to your crate. The beer arrives fresh every few weeks, allowing enough time to to fill a box and pay the least shipping. So why don't you check it out? It doesn't cost anything to sign up, and there's no obligation to purchase anything. If I can ask you a favor, go to Tavor.com, T-A-V as in Victor, O-U-R.com, or download the app. And when you sign up, enter the promo code BASICBREWING, all one word, and you'll get 10 bucks off your first shipment of $25 or more. So 10 bucks. By using the promo code Basic Brewing, all one word. Again, it's free to sign up and there's no obligation to purchase. Sign up at Tavor.com or the Tavor app and enter Basic Brewing as the promo code. Let's take a look into the mailbag. Josh writes I'm a long time yet infrequent home brewer who would like to brew more often than I do. The constraints that I have are typically financial in source and tend to build off one another. My equipment, mostly on the fermentation side, is a setup for small batch brewing, three gallons or fewer. But this leads to more expensive per bottle costs, which usually sway me to not brew but for special occasions. 
Josh says, I could revamp my fermentation equipment, but it's hard to justify the costs. After much thought about my process, I've decided to focus on lowering my brew day ingredient costs rather than increasing fermentation capacity. My question for you is, do you have any advice on doing that when it comes to small batch brewing, specifically keeping ingredient waste to a minimum? Well, thanks, Josh. I've personally taken some steps to keep ingredient waste down in my brewing, uh, small batches and bigger batches. For example, I'll usually round off my recipes to the whole pound for base malts and a whole ounce for specialty grains because that's what Steve's Brew Shop sells, uh, those increments. Um, and for so I'm not so I'm not buying more than I need and then, you know, like storing it and saying, oh, I'll use that later and then not using it. And for small extract batches, uh, Steve at Steve's Brew Shop sells one-pound bags of DME, and I'm sure your homebrew shop, your local homebrew shop does as well. So uh, so that's easy if you can buy one-pound bags of the dry malt extract. Nowadays, I just buy what I need for each recipe and don't try to stockpile, you know, giant bags of grain, for example, like I used to. I, I think I still have some, some really stale base malt and, and specialty grains somewhere in the house. Uh, hops is where it gets tricky. Uh, however, you can try techniques like, you know, sliding hop additions for pale ales, especially closer to the end of the boil. Uh, this lessens the IBUs, which is important if you're using a high alpha hop, uh, and it also increases the hop flavor. So you can kind of, tra you know, play with the hop placement uh, to maximize your uh, or optimize your IBUs and then uh, also increase your hop flavor and aroma. So uh, if you are buying in, say, one-ounce packets, you have to worry less about leftover hops that might stale over time. I have found that I can save leftover hops. Uh, thanks to the Hop Sampler series, I often have partial ounces of hops left over. So what I do is I just fold those packets over, seal them, and then keep them in the freezer. And I have used hops that have been kept that way for several weeks. Now, some leftover portions didn't fare as well, to be honest. Uh, you know, I smelled them, and they didn't smell the great, you know, and they didn't look as green, so I didn't use those. But uh, I was able to use a bunch in my dry hopped 15-minute Saison recently uh, that you saw on the uh, video episode. And the, those were really tasty. And those have been in the freezer for a while. So, last but not least... You can reuse yeast either by using a portion of the slurry from one small batch to go directly into the next batch from the fermenter or by harvesting the yeast and keeping it in the fridge for the future. Of course, you know, that brings in another level of uh, sanitization and discipline in that way, but it would save you some money. So I hope that's food for thought, Josh. Uh, if you out there have some tips or tricks uh, that you can use uh, or that you use to economize, especially for small batches, uh, drop me a line. I'll pass that along. Uh, speaking of saving money, Desiree and Dave from High Gravity in Tulsa are running a special in January just for basic brewing radio listeners. 20% off beer and wine kits all this month just for you guys. Just use the code BB20N20JAN on HighGravityBrew.com when you shop for beer and wine kits. You'll save 20% off. That's a great deal. Uh, some of the, If you look at HighGravityBrew.com this month on the homepage, some of the featured beer kits uh, are Catherine II Russian Imperial Stout, Boggy Bottom Barley Wine, and Northern Lights Winter Ale. Now, those are high-gravity beers, uh, so 20% off those can save you a bunch. And uh, if you make wine kits, you know, wine kits, uh, you know that making your own wine is easy, especially compared to beer, and it is less expensive per bottle than buying commercial wines. Now, with this special, it's even 20% less expensive. You just have to remember the code. So get a pen, BB20N20JAN, that's BB20IN20JAN, BB20N20JAN. HighGravityBrew.com is the place for electric brewing solutions and tons of great beer and wine kits, along with everything else that you need uh, for home brewing. BB20N20JAN 
at family-owned and operated HighGravityBrew.com during January for 20% off beer and wine kits. HighGravityBrew.com Okay, I've had an inferiority complex, to be honest, when it comes to wine. Uh, I want to explore and enjoy wine more along, you know, along with, uh, you know, make more of it at home. But I, but I kind of want to know what I'm doing. You know, I want to know what, what I'm making, for example. So when I saw the title uh, to Jim's book, A Beer Drinker's Guide to Knowing and Enjoying Fine Wine, I thought it would be a great opportunity to expand my horizons. Jim Locker, and welcome to Basic Brewing Radio. Well, thank you so much, James. It's a delight to be with you. You are the author of 50 Ways to Love Wine More, Adventures in Wine Appreciation, most recently, and then uh, A Beer Drinker's Guide to Knowing and Enjoying Fine Wine, which really caught my attention uh, when I heard of it, uh, because I am a home brewer, and I've tipped my toe into uh, making wine, but I... I'm intimidated by the whole wine thing. It's just, uh, you know, I can walk up to a, a refrigerator full of craft beers and I feel at home. And then I turn around and there's this sea of bottles that are just mystifying to me. So I want to I want to make more wine, you know, in my hobby. But I'm but I need some demystification. Can you help? Well, I hope so. I hope so. Actually, uh, a very interesting genesis for the book. I for years taught many wine classes. And of course, I had a lot of students who would come to me after the class and say, you know, I love wine and my friends all drink wine, but my husband slash boyfriend slash significant other slash whoever it was is a true beer lover. And I just can't get him or her interested in wine. So is there any, are there any tips you can give me uh, to maybe help me bridge that gap? So we had what I've come to refer to as cross-drinking couples. Uh, <laughs> one one likes the grains and one likes the grapes, and you know how do you how do you bring the two together? And I'll be honest with you, I I don't know that you ever bring the two completely together, nor should you bring them completely together. Uh, I I think one thing that uh, beer lovers will agree on uh, completely with wine lovers. And that is the first thing you have to be true to is your own palate. So whatever the critics say or whatever the writers say or whatever the gurus say, if you like it, it's good. And if you don't like it, it's not good for you. Hmm. So if you really love and favor the, the flavor profile and the taste that you get with beer, be it an ale or, or whatever, uh, you're more prone to that, uh, you're built that way, then why give up beer? And on the other hand, if you're more uh, uh, attuned to the flavors of grapes and fruit, then why give up wine? But that being said, there's so many similarities. And, you know, there's a saying in the wine world that says, uh, no good wine was made without great beer. And, and what that refers to, quite honestly, is the uh, harvest or what's called crush when the grapes are ripe and winemakers go into their, you know, CPA at tax time mode where they're working uh, 12, 15 hours a day for eight or 10 weeks. And that's really the bulk of their work for the year. Uh, but. There's nothing that a cellar rat loves more than a nice cold brew at the end of that day, I'm telling you. <laughs> so the the guy who shows up with a good six-pack is a hero in every winery uh, during Crush. So, you know, each of them has its own properties and uh, attributes. And I think it's just being comfortable, you know, not letting one or the other intimidate you. So as you mentioned a little earlier, you can stand in front of the fridge in, in the uh, market and look at 200 different uh, beers or craft brews and feel very comfortable and feel at home. And yet if you turn around and you see the shelf with 200 different wines on it, it kind of blows your mind. You're going, you know, what are these things and 
what's in these bottles and is this something I'm going to like or not like or whatever. And in all honesty, there's a there's an element in the wine world that want to keep it that way. You know, they want to protect their turf, if you will. So if you're intimidated by it, then they appoint themselves as the arbiter. You know, they can explain it to you. They can show it to you, whether it's sommeliers or wine writers or whatever. If everyone understood it and loved it, they'd be out of a job. <laughs> so I think you just have to relax and realize, again, that it's your palate. You know, you, you try things, and if you like them, do, do it again, or go to your good wine shop and ask the retailer if there's something similar to that. And if you don't like it, then make note of that as well, that I just don't care. Maybe it's a varietal. Maybe you try a, a Cabernet Sauvignon, and you just don't like it for whatever reason. It doesn't matter what the reason is. Then stop trying it. You know, don't buy another one. Go try a Chianti instead, a, a wine from, uh, from Italy. Uh, or go try anything else. Try a Zinfandel from California. So I think that we just need to be a little freer and a little more relaxed. And in terms of uh, what you like or don't like, just go with your own, not your gut, but your tongue. Mm. You know, your own tongue. Uh, because your own tongue will never steer you wrong. I, I would I would assume that... Uh that someone with a well-developed beer palate would ta be better to take or more easily trained as a, uh, a wine connoisseur than someone who's starting from scratch. Is that true or not? Uh, I think you're absolutely right. Uh, you know, when you look at, at doing what we call a sensory evaluation, whether it's on beer or wine, there are certain aspects of, of the uh, liquid, if you will, that are important. One is the color. Uh, one, of course, is the clarity of the uh, of the the beer or the wine. Uh, another is the aroma. Obviously, with beer, you want to assess when you're looking at it. You're going to be assessing the head as well. Uh, something you don't do when you're looking at wine. Hopefully, your wine doesn't have a head on it. <laughs> if it does, you may want to take that bottle back right away. Uh, <clears throat> But yes, you know, it's, it's really a matter, all of this, this geeky wine tasting things, you know, in wine, we've got the six S's, you know, see, sniff, swirl, swallow, and savor. All right, well, that's great. And in beer, there is a similar approach, but all of it really is paying attention. Instead of just gulping it down, just pay attention. How does this smell to you? Is the smell appealing? Is the smell unique? As you begin to learn more about either beer or wine, does the smell tell you anything about perhaps the ingredients or the way it was made? Uh, after the smell, yes, take a sip. You know, what's the weight of it? Is it heavy? Is it light? And in the wine world, people always ask me about body. We refer to things as being, you know, full bodied or light bodied. And I say it's very much like milk in that milk you would consider to be full bodied. Uh, uh, Two percent milk you would consider to be medium bodied. Skim milk you would consider to be light bodied. So you just just little assists, if you will. Uh, and and beyond that. Every good beer judge uh, is going to be looking for the same things as a good wine judge is. Now, it varies a little bit, yes, that a darker color in one doesn't necessarily mean the same thing as a darker color in the other. You know, a dark colored beer does not equate to a dark colored wine. And actually, if you'll let me run on here for a minute, James. <laughs> it makes my job easier if you do. So. <laughs> All right, great. People often ask the same group of people who kind of motivated me to write the book, uh, what kind of wine can I give to my beer drinking friend that will be appropriate? And people make a very common mistake. And the first one is they equate color. So in other words, they think if a beer is dark, that they should consequently 
uh, begin by giving this person a dark colored wine. Well, you know, as as you know, a lot of dark beers are actually slightly sweet. Mm-hmm. You know, a lot of stouts and so forth and porters, they, they may have a sweetness to them as well as a little bitterness to them. But it really uh, doesn't equate to a darker wine. You know, a darker wine is, is going to be darker because the, the grapes, the pulp, the mashed grapes and the skins have sat together longer and the color has leached out of the skins. So actually, what I tell them is don't worry and don't try to equate colors. You know, people who drink light colored beer don't necessarily uh, have a palate that's going to uh, allow them to like light colored wine. So one, one, one good example, I think, is we've got the guy who loves an imperial IPA. All right, well, when you pour that baby out in the glass, it's pretty light colored. Now, if you gave that person who's an IPA fan a glass of Pinot Grigio, <clears throat> which is a very light colored wine, it would be night and day. Because in the beer world, he or she is used to a rich, bold, you know, cutting, slap you in the face and get your attention, uh, gustatory experience. Whereas Pinot Grigio is you know, kind of one step up from water with a little wine flavoring in it. (laughs) So the two don't equate at all. The color doesn't really tell you anything. And in, in wine, it's kind of the same thing. You can have very intensely flavored light wines and very uh, intensely flavored dark wines. Let's dip into the uh, into the technical details uh, just a minute. You you talked about the differences between white wines and and red wines. It, it, back in the day, I thought that 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 white wines came from from green grapes and and red wines came from purple grapes, but <laughs> but that's not true. But the, talk about the differences in in the production of those two, you know, sort of styles of, of wines and what each bring to the table. Sure. Uh, first of all, ninety eight percent of all wine grapes have clear pulp and clear juice. So if you just squeeze them in your hand and drip them on the floor, that's going to be clear, whether it's a red grape or a white grape. Now, the difference is that red grapes uh, contain a lot of anthocyanins, a lot of polyphenols in the, in the skins. And so if you, as I alluded to earlier, if you mash these grapes up, and you let them sit in the skins, the, the color and the flavor elements and the tannins and so forth all leach out of the skins into the juice, turning the juice red or purple, as the case may be, but also adding a whole lot of flavor. When you make uh, white wine, the style that we make most white wine in is is intended to be very clean and clear. So. The white grapes are crushed, but then the juice is poured off the skins instantly, immediately. So it never comes in contact with the skins. So you've just got clear, what we call free run juice. And free run juice can be sweet and lovely, but it doesn't have the depth of flavor. It doesn't have the depth of aroma that you're often going to get with red wines because it has... Uh, a substantially lower amount of anthocyanins and other polyphenols in it. Again, you can make white wine from red grapes. So uh, one of the most famous examples would be a champagne called a Blanc de Noir, which means white from black. Hmm. And this uses all black grapes or two black grapes, Pinot Noir and Pinot Meunier. But these black grapes are squeezed and the juice is poured off immediately. And the resultant wine is a beautiful, clean, clear white wine. Uh, so, so you really just have to be aware of how it's being made. And again, when you've got the, the grapes that do have 
uh, colored skins, red skins or purple skins or black skins, as the case may be. Uh, those colors, which are present, uh, also indicate, as I mentioned, uh, aroma and tannin, which is what gives it structure, would be roughly equivalent, perhaps, to the bitterness in a beer, very mm -hmm. roughly, but nonetheless, that's what gives it a structure. Um, so there's also, uh, in modern winemaking, an idea that the darker a wine is, the richer or better it is, which isn't necessarily true. Uh, but a lot of winemakers will leave the must, as it's called, or this mash, uh, grape and skins and so forth, will leave it on the skins for a very long time so it absorbs a lot of color. So it, it's, you know, it's quite different from beer in that regard. And you can take uh, you can take the wine once it's uh, or the juice once it's uh, extracted from the grapes, and you can either uh, put it into a stainless steel fermenter or you can put it into wood, you know, barrels. Or so it it it, it the differences continue after that. Uh, but the, it, are there some guidelines? Like, for example, can you uh, age or should you age a red wine more than a uh, white wine, or is a white wine better fresh than than a red? Or, or are there some some guidelines? Well, there there are some rules of thumb that that have as many exceptions as you might imagine a rule of thumb to have. Uh, <laughs> The wines that age best do have a good helping of, uh, of anthocyanin in them, but they also have a good level of acidity. And acidity is something you don't talk about in beer making too much. Uh, but if you, if you take a mouthful of wine, particularly a red wine, and you just let it sit in your mouth as you're sipping, you'll notice that the sides of your tongue begin to water, that your mouth actually begins to water. And that's because of the acid in the wine. And acid in wine is, is good for a couple of reasons. One is it allows the wine to age longer. Number two is that the acidity through the very fact that it makes your mouth water uh, makes the wine very food friendly. So it's a great wine to have with food. And you will find uh, as an example, and this is, a, a, again, uh, a, a big generalization, but you will find that Italian wines tend to be quite acidic. And Italian wines are actually designed and made to accompany food. Italians almost never drink w red wine by itself. I mean, they just consider it another, another dish uh, in the meal. So uh, it makes it more juicy. What's actually happening, if you want to get a little geeky here, is that the acid is in the wine is telling your body, your tongue, that there's acid. And so your body, to defend against the, the lowering of the pH, starts to excrete saliva. And the purpose is for the saliva to nullify the lowered pH of the acid. So that's why your mouth waters. That's why your mouth waters at any time. It's really uh, your body defending against an increase in acid. And your mouth will water with food, not because you're, you're introducing acid into your mouth from a foreign substance like wine, but from your stomach, from your salivary glands. You're getting ready to digest this food that smells so good, and part of the response of your body, again, is to nullify the acid, and that's why we get this mouth-watering effect. Now, we've got a lot of sour beer fans out there, so we. <laughs> yes, yes. I have to call, call out to them. Uh, you know, we're, we're familiar with the sour or the acidic uh, aspects of, of the beverages, too. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, you say that um, you talked about, uh, you know, whether to age a, a wine or not. Uh, and, and some wines actually benefit from, from aging and should be aged. Some wines do. Let's be realistic, though. I would say, James, that probably 
90% of wines are made to be drunk within two or three years of their vintage date, red or white. They're just not designed. I mean, they're consumer products. You know, they're not designed to go in someone's collection necessarily. They're designed to go on the store shelf and get turned over so that next vintage can come in and replace them. I mean, that's the commercial world we live in. Uh, there are wines that are designed to be aged because they have been for years and they undergo a lot of uh, transitions when they're aged. So, for instance, we talked about tannin. And for folks who aren't really familiar with tannin, think about drinking an incredibly strong tea, for instance. Mm -hmm. And it gives you that puckery effect in your mouth. That's, that's the effect of tannins. So what happens when you age a wine that is young and bold and has a lot of those polyphenols we talked about is it tends to be very high in tannin and it also tends to be very rich in color. When it ages, what's, what happens is what's called polymerization, which means that the molecules of tannin link together with the molecules of, of the color, the co actual colorant in the wine, and they become too heavy and they drop out of suspension. So in an old bottle of wine, you'll often find sediment at the bottom. And this sediment is the result of this polymerization of the tannins and, and the uh, coloring agents dropping out of suspension. What that does to the wine is by reducing the, uh, the level of tannin, it smooths the wine out. So just as a tactile experience in your mouth, the wine is much smoother and it also lightens the color. It's interesting as red wine gets older, it, it goes through a series of stages where it will be, you know, maybe inky purple and then it will be just kind of rich purple and then maybe a ruby purple and then maybe a ruby red and then uh, a little, a little brickiness. Uh, a brick color around the edges and then it will turn kind of orange bricky and then it will get kind of brownish and and it will become brown eventually. Ironically, when white wine ages, it also becomes brown. So the older wines are, the more alike they actually look, whether they're red or white. Hmm. And the, the white wine becomes brown because it's being oxidized. The red wine becomes brown because it's being oxidized, but it's also getting these color shifts. So it, it's quite interesting. Uh, you will also have what we refer to as tertiary flavors coming in. So in the wine world, they refer to primary flavors as the flavors of the grape itself. So, you know, take a handful of grapes and eat them up. And whatever flavors you're getting in there, the sweetness, the the various fruit flavors, etc. Those are the primary flavors. After the wine is fermented, or after the grapes are fermented, uh, then we have what are called the secondary flavors. And these are things that are often the result of the fermentation process itself. And so they may add, uh, they may add uh, a little green pepper note to it. It may add, uh, you know, any number of uh, sulfuric notes to it. Anyway, these are called the secondary flavors. And then the tertiary flavors are the flavors that come as a result of longer aging, being in wood. So when, when a wine is aged in wood, you'll begin to get flavors like possibly dill in American oak, uh, possibly coconut, uh, vanilla, tobacco, etc. So those are all what are called tertiary flavors, and you won't get those in a very young red wine. You only get those in a wine that's aged. So that's a big plus for aging. And on the, uh, on the section of the book, uh, when you talk about sensory evaluation, you said that by looking at your wine glass in a certain way, you can sort of tell if, if a wine has been aged or not. Talk about that. When you're looking at a wine, when you're evaluating it visually, you should tilt it so that the uh, the surface 
instead of being a circle in, in a regular wine glass, now becomes an oval. So you've got the glass tilted over. And this is so you can more clearly discern the rim or the meniscus of the wine. And as a wine ages, those color shifts that I talked about, going from pure red or pure purple into an orange or an amber or a brown, and uh, if you look at a wine and you tilt it to the side and it's perfectly clear at the edge uh, or the edge color is exactly the same as the color in the middle, that's a giveaway that it's a very young wine. On the other hand, if you look at it and maybe in the middle of the, uh, of the, of the wine, of the surface of the wine, uh, it's a rich ruby red, but then around the edges it kind of looks kind of bricky, a little brick coloring, a little orange coloring starting. That's telling you that this is a wine that's beginning to age. It has a few more years on it. And the extremes just continue as the wine gets older. So that's a little tip that the beer lover can take into a, a wine tasting and potentially impress, you know, some, some fellow wine geeks. Absolutely. You know, just Hold that glass up and tilt it over and take a look. And if you see some some brown around the edge, uh, then just say, "Oh, this is a few years old, isn't it?" You know, or something something witty like that. Absolutely, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Now, and the there are reasons for other things. You know, people often ask about the swirling. You know, what's with the swirling of the wine glass all the time? And actually, the purpose of swirling is to coat the inside of the glass with a very thin layer of wine. And by thin, I'm talking a molecule or two thick. And the reason is because if it's very thin like that, it evaporates quickly. It's a volatile substance. And so if you swirl your glass and then stick your nose down in it, that, uh, that wine will uh, evaporate very quickly into your nasal passages, and it will give you the clues that you want, the aromas and the smells. Whereas if you, if you never swirl and just sits there, you're not going to smell as much because those volatile substances aren't being released into the atmosphere. You'll see, you'll see beer geeks uh, <laughs> swirling our glasses uh, <laughs> in a similar fashion. Uh, but whereas, uh, you know, we get we get foam sticking on the inside of the glass or hopefully, you know, when we swirl around, when you're looking at a glass of wine, you, you get some visual clues about the about what's sticking to the side of the glass as well. Well, you do. And uh, you're looking for the depth of the the actual color, the depth of the color and how clear and clean the liquid is. <clears throat> and these things can tell you, as in the beer world, they, they can tell you any number of things. Once you're really practiced, and practice sounds like a big word, but it just means drink a lot, you know. <laughs> it's research. Absolutely. Same whether you're, you know, you're studying beer or wine or bourbon or whatever it is. Uh, practice means you drink a lot. But it also means you pay attention when you're drinking. That's, that's the difference, I guess. But uh, there are certain shades. So, for instance, some wines will never be dark red. If you look, uh, for instance, at a, at a Pinot Noir, you'll never find a really dark, deep Pinot Noir because the skins of Pinot Noir just do not contain that level of anthocyanins that will give you that dark, rich color. So if I look at a, at a glass of wine and no one's told me what it is, and I look in there and it's kind of inky black, I mean, it's really deep and rich, the first thing I can do is cross Pinot Noir off the list. I know it's not going to be a Pinot Noir. It just, Pinots never get that dark. So, you know, there's a lot of this trial and error stuff and just learning it's it's helpful in this way to have a reference because this isn't just stuff that you can just know. Uh, this is stuff that you've got to learn by experience and by tasting and by taking notes and, and keeping a record of your own preferences. But you do a good job in the book of, of talking about different uh, styles of, or varieties of, of grapes and then talking about the different regions of the world where 
grapes are grown and wine is made. And that's important because, say, you know, in northwest Arkansas, a brewery can order the proper ingredients and do the pro- the proper water chemistry and come up with a world-class pilsner that is, that is you know, typical of the region where where pilsner was first brewed. Sure. But you can't do that if you're a, a winery. Right. Well, you, you shouldn't do that. Let's put it that <laughs> way. Uh, you shouldn't do that. No, you're absolutely right. I mean, uh, northwest Arkansas and Czechoslovakia are not the same place. And it's, it's uh, <clears throat> one of the, I think, the major differences is that beer is brewed from a commodity, that being barley primarily, which can be grown and stored indefinitely and shipped to anywhere. So, yes, I can grow uh, barley or hops here, there, or anywhere, uh, harvest it, uh, store it, ship it, and you can make beer with it, and the beer is going to be great. It's going to show all the characteristics of, of the particular uh, variety and so forth, and uh, it's going to work well. With wine, you have much less room, if you will, to, uh, to improvise. Uh, you know, you get a harvest once a year, and that's it. And uh, every wine variety grape variety reflects the place that it was grown to a much greater degree than grains do. So if I grow uh, Merlot in uh, part of France uh, called Bordeaux, it's going to be a very different animal than if I grow that same Merlot in Southern California. It's going to taste different. It's going to have uh, different levels of tannins, different uh, uh, different aromas, etc. Now, it's still going to be, to someone who really knows wine, it's still going to be identifiable as a Merlot, but it's going to be a very different animal. So when I said, yes, but you shouldn't, what I was referring to is that a lot of factory wine And believe me, folks, all of you wonderful craft brewers who got into the business or into the passion of craft brewing uh, because you wanted to get away from what was being sold on the shelves, the lovely uh, American lager, the light American lager, whatever the term is that's being used these days, you know what I'm talking about. Uh, There is a wine or a Venice equivalent to that. And you will see places that don't identify on the bottle where they are from. So instead of, uh, let's say, a a bottle from California, instead of saying it's from Napa Valley or it's from Sonoma or it's from even more specifically uh, Russian River Valley or Paso Robles or whatever, it will simply say California. That's all the geographic indication it will give you. Well, what that means is that these grapes were grown anywhere in the state. They were shipped in, they were trucked in, uh, they were put together, and you're getting essentially a factory wine. So it's the same thing as in the beer world. Uh, We also are fighting something else that is happening in the beer world, and that's consolidation. There are two or three major corporations in the wine world that have for years been sucking up wineries. Mm. And unfortunately, in most cases, the wineries they bought were fairly interesting, distinctive, but small. And yet you knew that that this particular winery put out a really good uh, Cabernet Franc, or they put out a really good Meritage blend, or whatever it is. And yet one of the big uh, behemoths buys them, and two or three years later, they're just, they've been used to fill up, uh, to plug in a price point in this corporate wine producer's portfolio. They no longer have any any personality 
the grapes aren't made uh, from grapes grown on that particular estate anymore. <clears throat> They're now just shipped in from whatever. They're made by formula. Uh, the winemakers have become recipe followers. Uh, it's very common. And, and we were talking a little earlier. Uh, I lived in Chicago for many years, and I was there when Goose Island, as an example, was bought out. Uh, what do you do with Goose Island if you're a craft lover at this point? Uh, yes, they have maintained some integrity. Uh, they still make some pretty good, uh, pretty good beers, but they've also lost a lot. And some of the beers that used to be great are just mediocre at best now. And as in, in the beer world, in the wine world, these corporations are buying up a lot too many wineries as far as I'm concerned. Mm. Uh, and yet there's always someone, uh, a, a, a young couple or someone who uh, is a new winemaker who wants to go out on his own or their own and uh, do their own thing. So you've got to keep looking for those people. So it sounds like all in all, Jim, beer drinkers and wine drinkers have a lot in common and there's there's nothing saying that we we can't all get along, if not all kind of mingle together in our in our tastes, uh, in our in our drinking uh, preferences. Well, no, you're absolutely right. We have a lot more in common uh, than we think. I mean, it's like the humans and the chimps. You know, ninety nine point nine percent of our DNA is the same. Uh, maybe that, <laughs> that may be a bad analogy, but uh, and some some of us our knuckles drag the ground. But other than that. <laughs> Well, I, what, one thing that I tell people, and I think this will tell you a little bit about where my, my attitude lies in all this, people ask me, what's the best wine to bring to a party? I mean, I, I get that all the time. In the summer, it's a barbecue. You know, in the winter, it's a Christmas party or the Super Bowl party or whatever the case may be. So my answer always is about variety. I said, it doesn't matter what your guest list is, bring three or four wines that you think are interesting and uh, worth trying that you would like to share. And also, also on that same table where you're laying out the booze, make sure you bring three or four great, uh, great craft brews. Because some of your people uh, are going to, you may think you're a wine person and all your uh, friends and associates are winos, but you put some good beer out there, and I guarantee it's going to be gone by the end of the night. So take <laughs> care of everybody that you invite to your home. You know, take care of everybody uh, and show them all the hospitality. Get some great beer for your beer loving friends, and get some great wine for your wine loving friends, and sit down with each other and try each other's favorite drink, and and just have a great time because in the end. Whether it's beer or whether it's wine, the whole idea is to give us pleasure and to enhance our sociability. There you go. A Amen, brother. We've, we've just scratched the surface uh, on, uh, on the books. Uh, a, beer, a Beer Drinker's Guide to Knowing and Enjoying Fine Wine uh, and uh, 50 Ways to Love. Once you, once you start loving wine, uh, you go to 50 Ways to Love Wine More, Adventures in Wine Appreciation. It's, it, both of them are fun reads, and, and uh, you've opened my eyes and, and taught me some things, and, and I appreciate your coming on. Well, thank you so much. It's been a delight. Uh, I always love talking about fermented beverage <laughs> of, of any stripe, and uh, I wish you and your audience uh, good drinking. Same to you. Thanks, Jim. Well, thanks again to Jim. As I said in the interview, we just scratched the surface uh, Jim gives a lot of uh, technical info in the book and gives a, a great overview, uh, you know, kind of geographically of where the better wine varieties come from. So uh, it's a fun uh, resource uh, if, you, if you're just getting into, if you're just like me, if you're a wine newbie. If you have brewing questions, show suggestions, or just want to say howdy, write to james at basicbrewing.com or just fill out the contact form on basicbrewing.com. And please don't forget to tell us where you're from. Check out our mobile-friendly shop at basicbrewingshop.com. Thanks to everybody supporting us through our Patreon page. Special goodies coming your way. Check that out at patreon.com slash basicbrewing. 
So until next time, till then, thanks for listening, everybody. I'm James Spencer, production help for Basic Brewing Radio and our website is provided by Kelly Dodson. Basic Brewing Radio is a production of Active Voice, and we'll talk to you next time, everybody. So long.